Okay, so you may be seated. First of all, sorry, forgot about that. Um, today, I would like to give you 17 biblical defining marks of a church. And because I have about 17 minutes to do this, you've got to listen fast. I'm not going to be able to go into depth. I'm not going to be able to um, even go to the passages. I'm just going to give you a reference for each. But my wife and I recently have been talking about the church and what is the church supposed to be. And we encounter people and talk to people who you, – you hear all sorts of perspectives on the church, right? Like, well, we, we – do home church on Sundays, or we do church over Zoom, or the church today doesn't look like the church in Acts, or where, why does the Bible, the Bible doesn't really say we have to go to church. I'm a Christian, I'm a spiritual person, but I don't go to church. You hear all these different takes on the church, and if we're not ready with biblical ecclesiology, and what is ecclesiology? It's the study of the church. If we're not ready with a biblical ecclesiology, if we don't get what the Bible says, then we don't really have a good answer for all of these ideas that are floating around out there about what the church is supposed to be. So what does scripture say about the church of God? How is the church of God supposed to look according to the Bible? So like I said, I got 17 little, just kind of like defining marks or principles. This is not so much like theological stuff the church is supposed to believe. This is nuts and bolts. What do we see in scripture about how the church works? Okay, so number one, the church is a global body. The church of Christ is worldwide. That's believers. I'm a member of the same church that the believing Nigerian man who's in church today, or, you know, I don't know what time it is in Nigeria, but you know what I'm saying, that, you know, I've got brothers across the world, brothers and sisters that are members of this global body. The church is a global body. See that in Ephesians 5. See that in Matthew 16, 18. There's your two references. Ephesians 5, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus says on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's not talking about one local church. This, just this one's going to take over hell. And he's saying his church, Ephesians 5, it's the bride of Christ, the worldwide bride of Christ. Okay, so number one, global body, Ephesians 5, Matthew 16, 18. Number two, this global body manifests in specific local assemblies. So number two is specific local assemblies. You can see this in Acts eleven twenty six. You can see this in Revelation chapters 1 through 3 and many other places throughout Scripture. There's a constant, I mean, the New Testament is full of letters to churches, addresses to churches, exhortations to elders of churches. The biblical pattern is very clear that that global church takes a form of a local body. So it's not enough to say, well, I'm a member of the global church, but I don't really want to be a part of any kind of local body. You didn't get that from Scripture. And just two references you can go to to prove that are Acts 11, 26 and Revelation 1, Revelation 1 through 3. But really, just read the New Testament and you're not, it's not there. You can't get that. Um, I, I love the phrase that you can't, you can be a Christian and not go to church just like you can be a zebra that's separated from its herd and being devoured by cheetahs and you're still a zebra. But that's not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be with the herd. That's how you fend off the wolves. That's how God designed it. Ultimately, Christ is the one that defends us from the wolves. But he has made a way for his people to work. And we see that on our point number two. That's in specific local assemblies. Number three, with appointed leadership. So it's not enough that, well, we just kind of have a fellowship. We get together and, you know, this dad preaches this week and this dad preaches this week. And we watch a YouTube video this week. And that's not what we see in the Bible. There is appointed leadership at the churches. Acts 14.23, Titus 1.5, among others, there is appointed eldership within the churches. And, just a side note, but it is, biblically, the pattern is a plurality of eldership. So there are some people that argue for just a single pastor at every church that's the way it's supposed to be. We do not currently have a plurality of eldership. We've tried, and I would encourage everybody to pray towards that, because that's what we want, because that's what we see in Scripture, is a plurality of of appointed elders. That's the way God designed it. Acts 14.23, Titus 1, five. Number four. The church requires regular assembly. The pattern we see in scriptures of regular assembly, you see that over and over and over again in the pattern of the New Testament and then specifically commanded in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, do not forsake assembling together, as is the habit of some. Number four is requiring regular assembly. Hebrews 10.25. So a Christmas and Easter, 
occasionally going to church, that's not biblical. It's that you didn't get there from Scripture. If you want to know what God says about how church works, you have to assemble with the saints. That's how he designed it. You're not, you can't bear one another's burdens. You can't confront one another's sins. You see everybody twice a year, three times a year. No, that you have to be regularly in one another's, one another's lives so that when the, uh, so that instead of the video coming out from your uh, ring camera, you know, months later, because nobody, nobody was involved in your life to call you out way in advance while you treat your wife like that. Just picking out an example. Point being, we should be in one another's lives to that point where we can exhort and rebuke each other. Okay, uh-huh. if I can jump in there. Along the way, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I want you to be able to ask questions as you're piling through. The, this is so much, and it's good, and you can write down. And will you be able to send out your notes, do you think? We, somehow. <coughs> I can send out the audio recording of this. It'll be on my podcast. My notes are on paper, so I don't. there's no okay. easy way to send that out. But okay. this will be on my podcast if you want to listen through it again. And yeah. All right, do you want us to come? Maybe we should come back to that. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw everything off. I'm going to preface it with that. I figured that was going to be easy. Yeah, um, maybe it's something that we can come back to and and further, because you're going to open up a lot of questions with these. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so I mean, just briefly, what is appointed leadership? That I mean, there's. That looks different in so many different denominations, so on and so forth. But basically, you have a biblical category of elder and deacon. And there are requirements listed for those two offices. So those are the primary offices you're going to see. Is the office of elder and the office of deacon. And so... They're both by the Bible. They're they're affirmed by laying on of hands in scripture. Right. So there's an appointment process. So it's not just kind of people randomly do nice things in the church. There's actually an appointed... So in, in our case, dad is the appointed elder of our church. And we hope at some point to have a plurality of appointed elders um, that's, that's distinct from just people that are involved in church. We should all be involved in church. But there is an appointed eldership, and Scripture tells us to, and I'll get this on a later point, but the appointed eldership actually has authority. that God, said, God tells the people in the church, submit to your elders, they have charge over your souls. There's an authority structure there that you don't get if you don't have appointed eldership, then it's just kind of, well, so who here has authority over whose souls and is a shepherd? You lose the whole picture. It's supposed to be there's a shepherd or shepherds that are watching over the flock and involved in the lives of the flock that meet the biblical requirements for eldership and fulfill the biblical duties for the elders and the deacons. So that's really brief, but we can dive into that more. Okay. Four, requiring regular assembly, Hebrews 10, 25. Five, receiving corporate blessing and chastening from Christ. I thought this was really interesting thinking about this, but in the book of Revelation, Jesus proclaims blessing and also warnings of impending judgment on churches as a church. It's kind of scary. Jesus addresses a church. He didn't, he didn't go through and identify, okay, you're, you're a good guy and you're not a good guy and I'm going to punish this person and bless this. He said, your church... You guys are lukewarm, and you better repent, or I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. As a church. So there is a sense to which God deals with bodies of believers. That's something that we should take seriously. We should be coming before the Lord and saying, are we a faithful church? Do we have sin in our midst? We want to be a church that is blessed by God. We want to be a church that is on fire for Christ. As a body. So in America, we're so radically individualistic about everything. The Bible's not so radically individualistic. The Bible talks about households. The Bible talks about churches. And we need to be thinking in the context of our people. You guys are my people. And as a people, we should want to be a people that is bearing fruit for Christ. A people that is favored by God. We should be praying and thinking and working towards that together as brothers in arms. Not just kind of like, I hope you're a good Christian over there. I'm trying to be a good Christian over here. See you next Sunday. No, this is a, we're a squad. You know, we're, we're a band of brothers here. We're a easy company, right? Easy company on the battlefield together trying to achieve an objective. And that's the way we're supposed to think biblically. 
Okay, five, receiving corporate blessing and chastening from Christ, Revelation 1 to 3. Six, whose leaders have authority. I already mentioned this, Hebrews 13, 17. The leaders, the appointed leaders, the eldership of the church has been given an authority by God. We talked about this last week with the authority of a patriarch. Any man who wants authority over his wife but will not submit to the authority of the church is picking and choosing from Scripture. A godly man will exercise authority in his home, but he will also submit himself to the other authorities that God has set up. And church authority is one of those. The elders of the church have a real authority. Scripture says, submit to your, your leaders as those who have charge over your soul. So that's part of God's pattern, God's structure for church eldership. So this, this uh, family get-togethers on Sunday doesn't cut that because what does the Bible say? The Bible says, no, there are appointed elders that have an actual designated authority by God. The idea of just we have Christian hangouts on Sunday does not fit that bill. And honestly, a lot of the churches in America that even technically have pastors still don't fit that bill. Because, yeah, you're, you're the guy that preaches. You're the guy that gets up there and talks. But there's no authority. There's no involvement. There's no church discipline. There's no respect. There's no anything. It's just, and sometimes, honestly, from the pulpit, that attitude is even encouraged. There is no, there's no, it's just another one of the homies. That's not biblical. Okay? So number six, Hebrews 13, 17. The appointed leaders of the church have authority granted them by God. Not to be abused. They can be held accountable. We can dive into all of that later. There are no human authority is without limitation. But that authority is there. Okay, number seven, where church discipline is practiced. See this in Matthew 18, 17. 1 Corinthians 5, 11, and 12. Matthew 18, 17, Jesus walks through the process of confronting someone in sin. You go to them, come back with a couple more people. Then you come back with the church. If you don't have a local church, you can't do that. There's no way to do it. There's no way to obey Jesus' commands of pursuing sin until it is dealt with if you're not a member of a local church. So church discipline is practiced in God-fearing churches where there is sin that is not being dealt with. That's how God designed the church to be. We deal with sin. So that's number seven, church discipline is practiced. Matthew 18, 17, 1 Corinthians 5, 11, and 12. Number eight, where souls are watched over. I nodded to this as well. The elders specifically called to watch over the souls of the flock, Hebrews 13, 17, and Titus 1, 9. Now think about that for a second. And if you are not a member of a local church, that should scare you. That should really scare you. Because God is saying, I designed this church and appointed the men in this church to watch over the souls of the flock. What is the implication? If you are not under pastoral authority, if you are not under pastoral influence in your life, what is a pastor? It come, I believe it comes from the word for pasture. It's a shepherd, right? So this is not, and scripture even specifically says, so we're not talking about these pastors who are like, they, they have, they're all hopped up on their own authority and they're just like trying to rule the flock with an iron fist. No, we're not talking about that. But we are talking about pastors who are involved with their people. Scripture says they're not to use it domineering over those under their charge. But they are supposed to be involved in the lives of their flock. And the flock should be submitting to that pastoral authority. And that is part of God's design for the protection of his people. So if souls are watched over in the church and you're not in the church, that means you are vulnerable. That means that, that, zebra, that zebra line, while somewhat humorous, is actually extremely accurate and very biblical. You are a sheep... Outside Now, we know Jesus is the chief shepherd, right? But he's appointed under shepherds. What does he tell Peter? Feed my sheep. Why? Well, because Peter is an under shepherd. Is Peter a replacement for Christ? Of course not. But he does have a role in, in watching over the sheep and feeding the flock. So what is a sheep that is outside of a local fold that has no shepherd? That sheep is vulnerable. That sheep is likely to fall prey to wolves. And we've seen this over and over and over again. And it's heartbreaking. And chillingly predictable. When families leave the church, and then three years later, stuff starts happening, and you're thinking, where did that come from? Well, there's no one keeping watch over those souls the way that God designed it to be done. So if you are not a member of a local church, that should scare you. And this is not like an intimidation ta tactic to make you stay in our church. No, this is not about coming to our church. It's about coming to a faithful church and being under godly shepherding, 
godly pastoring because that's one of God's designs for protection. Do you want protection on your soul? Do you want protection for your household? Then go with what the Bible says, okay? Souls are washed over, Hebrews 13, 17, and Titus 1, 9. Number nine, church is a place where believers sharpen one another, bear one another's burdens, and exercise their varying spiritual gifts for mutual edification. That's a big sentence, so I'll read it twice. Where believers sharpen one another, bear one another's burdens, and exercise their varying spiritual gifts for mutual edification. It's Galatians 6, 2, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Galatians 6, 2, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. If you're outside of the church, you're missing out on all of that. God designed the local church, the local church, because you can't do this with people in Nigeria, unless you're in Nigeria, right? You can't do this with a church in France, unless you're in France, then then you can. But when you're here in Arizona, you can't do it with them. I can't bear their burdens because I don't know them. I got no idea what's going on in their lives. I can't help them go, you know, counsel them biblically or be counseled by them biblically. I, there's no connection there. No, we have to be in a local church so that we can sharpen one another. We can call one each other out on sin. We can bear each other's burdens. We can exercise our gifts to bless each other, to edify the body. That's how God designed it to be. You can't do that outside of the context of a local body. Galatians 6, 2, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Okay, number 10. Where conflict is dealt with, Ephesians chapter 4. The church is the place where conflict is dealt with. The church should be the place where sin is resolved, where anger is answered, where bitterness is uprooted, where sin and conflict are dealt with. Ephesians chapter 4 talks all about being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That should be a hallmark of the church. You come into the church and there's unity, not conformity, not sameness, not necessarily even lack of conflict but rather a passionate pursuit of dealing with conflict and love to where when we come to the Lord's table, yeah, we really just had to hash out some stuff last week and it wasn't really pleasant, but now I'm happy to break bread with you because we work through it and we're pursuing the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Not because we agree on everything, but because we love one another. We've dealt with the sin issues. We've dealt with the big issues and we have grace to cover the small issues. Ephesians chapter four, come to the church. That's where conflict is dealt with or where it should be. So a church that is sweeping conflict under the rug, a church that is a soap opera every Sunday, that's a church that is missing part of the biblical pattern of church life. And if you're leaving a church because of conflict that's not being dealt with, then either you or they or both are missing this because God has called us to work these things out. Okay? So... The church should stand in stark contrariety to all the superficial friendships of the world around us and all the the broken families and all the buried bitternesses because in the church, conflict and sin are dealt with. Also, just a quick note, reminder to us all, but we talked about hypocrisy and these churches that where it comes out, oh, this pastor has actually been embezzling money and, and sleeping with the secretary and all this stuff. That should not be happening in the church of Christ. That is hypocrisy, and it's an absolute blemish on the name of Christ to do that sort of thing. And this is why, as the church, we should be, I mean, one of many reasons why it's, it's commanded by Scripture, but we should be pursuing holiness, holding one another accountable. If, if this stuff is happening, then we've got ache and sin going on, and we've got to pray for God to, to reveal those things. I mean, we can look at any other church and say, oh, this is what they did wrong. If they would have just done it like that, like us, then they would have been fine. Eh, now we need God's grace. We do want to follow the biblical principles of confronting and dealing with sin. But may it not be here. May it not be said of this place that we didn't pay attention. We weren't involved in each other's lives. We weren't praying for one another. We weren't, we had that, that curiosity in the back of our head and we never asked the question, whatever, fill in the blank. May we be a people that's, in it to win it together for the glory of Christ. Okay, 11, where the sacraments are administered. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 34. You see in scripture, we've got the Lord's Supper and baptism are our two sacraments that we see in, in the New Testament for the church. And the Lord's Supper specifically is given in the context of you break bread together. It's specifically given, it's talked about by Paul in the context of part of the church order of service. It's even presented by Christ to the disciples in a community gathering at the, their 
Passover meal. So this, this wasn't just kind of a random, ah, I mean, any, any dad can do that at home. No, this is a church function. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper is a church function. And if you're not in the church and you're not getting that, you're actually not getting something that God designed for you. Now, you can get into your theology of what the Lord's Supper does spiritually. I honestly don't feel qualified to speak to that because I've heard people, you know, it's a means of grace and all this different stuff. And I don't know. I know we don't believe in transubstantiation where it actually turns into the body and blood of Christ. That's a Catholic, Catholic doctrine and we're not into that. Beyond that, we can hash that out later. My point is, it's enough for me that God told me to do it. And if I'm not in a church, I can't be. I can't do it. And that's a problem for me. I want to be doing what Scripture tells me to do, which is do this in remembrance of Christ. You have to be in a local church to do it. Baptism, um, again, I, don't, I, I haven't done enough study on the theology of baptism to go into that into, into major detail. We know like Philip baptized the Ethiopian, and that was not in a church context. At the same time, we have Paul talking about how he baptized such and such and such and such within the church. So I, we can get into that later. We know baptism is commanded, and the normal practice that we've seen is in the context of a church. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that there. Point being, where the sacraments are administered, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to, 24, to 34. Number 12, where we keep the traditions, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Where we keep the traditions, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. There's a reason that, church, that Christians have done church for 2,000 years. And that alone should give really big pause to anybody who thinks, well, I think church should be a... Uh, like, a, you know, fireside hangout, or I think church should be a, a get-together on Saturday nights at the movie theater. Or the, Christians have been doing it this way on the Lord's Day for 2,000 years with preaching and singing and praying. That, that, I don't care what denomination. Pick a denomination. These basic elements have been present for 2,000 years of Christian history. Going outside of that is a very, very serious thing. So there is a, we're not, we don't set church tradition on the same plane as scripture. So that's why this is number 12 on the list. At the same time, we should take very seriously. This is what our forefathers have done for 2,000 years. We see it in the New Testament. And it's continued until this day. But I just figured out a better way to do it. Eh, that, that, that should make us shake in our boots a little bit. Okay. 13, it's a place for prayer. 1 Timothy 2.8 and 1 Timothy 2.1. These are specific elements. I'm giving Bible references for specific elements of the service. A, a place for prayer, 1 Timothy 2.8 and 1 Timothy 2.1. A place for preaching, Titus 1.9, 1 Timothy 3.2, 1 Corinthians 14.19, and 1 Timothy 2.11 and 12. And a place for singing, Ephesians 5.19, Psalm 100, verse 4. Ephesians 5, 19, Psalm 100, verse 4. So you've got prayer, preaching, singing, and breaking bread. Acts 20, verse 7. That was 13, 14, 15, and 16. So we are making progress on our list here. 13, 14, 15, and 16. Prayer, preaching, singing, breaking bread. And 17, caring for the needy. That's something that the church does in Scripture as a community. Cares for the needy. It's something that I would love to talk about more. How can we be doing that in our church? You see that in Galatians 2.10, 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. The church is called to be the hands and feet of Christ. So that's something that we want to do in, uh, in our fellowship here as well. So at the, end, at the end of it all, to sum up, Jesus loves his church. He died for his church. Yes, he loves us individually. He knows us individually. He cares for us individually. And we have a personal walk with him. But we're so used to thinking of him as our personal Lord and Savior that sometimes we need to take a pause and without taking away from that at all, because he is our personal Lord and Savior. He does love us. He forgives us. We are his children. We are the prodigal son. In any given one of us is the prodigal son running home. And the father is waiting with open arms to meet us. That said, Jesus died for his church too. He died for you. He died for me. But it's not just about you. It's not just about me. He's saving a bride for himself. That is the church. He loves his bride. Yeah, he loves you. He loves me. Don't take away from that at all. That is a glorious, precious truth. But he loves his bride. He's building a kingdom. He's building a church 
that the gates of hell will not stand against. And if he loves his church that much, then we should too. Ephesians 5 and Matthew 16, 18. We should think about the church of Christ like our Savior does.